This is Pastor Mike Smith at Church of the Living God. Thanks for joining us on the Living Godcast. I'd like to personally invite you to sharing and hearing from God today through the following message. If this message speaks to you, I encourage you to share this podcast with a friend. We pray God's blessings over your life. And now let's enjoy today's podcast. service so far. It's been good, hasn't it? Just me? No? All right. Somebody want this? <laughs> Got to spread out on the, on the podium here. Hey, man, what a great presence of the Lord in the place. As he said this morning, it was awesome. Tonight's just been powerful, man. It's just been real, hasn't it? It's just been real tonight, and uh, I've been drinking it in all night. I'm going to be honest with you. This sermon I have tonight, uh, the last time I preached a couple of weeks ago, Whenever I preached, I prepared two, and I couldn't decide which one to do until kind of last minute God kind of directed me. So tonight I'm doing the other one because at 4.15 he said I was preaching. So he knew, and, and no joke, as I was telling Pastor Mike while you were talking and almost preaching my sermon, that uh, you know it really lines up with what's been said tonight and what I feel like God's trying to communicate. We, we've talked about uh, through the songs him looking beyond our faults and seeing our need. And, you know, so many times we've been there, a man where, you know, he didn't have to answer, but he did. Right? Where we didn't necessarily deserve it, but he did anyway. And he answered us, and he gave us the right and the best answer. And that's what we need. Amen? You know, sometimes we have this preconceived idea about what maybe God should do in our situation. But so many times God shows up and does what he knows we need. And he does the best thing. And I want the best answer. Amen? That's what I want. And, and, you know, we can sing about him looking beyond our faults. But every now and then, it gets beyond the faults. And we need something to materialize. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. I'm a a process kind of guy. I'm a methodical kind of guy. Drives him nuts. Uh, I'm just a, a detailed guy. He appreciates it. But... You know, he, he's a big picture person, and, and that's awesome. we got to have visionary people in the world, right? Nothing would ever happen without visionary people. But then you got to have detailed people to help bring the vision to pass. And that's, that's the kind of person I am. And I talk a lot about process, and, and I want to talk tonight about the process of inheritance. I want to talk about the beyond, the faults. I want to talk about the best answer, what he supplies what he manifests when we ask. What do you have access to that maybe you're not tapping into just yet? He asked the question, how much do you want? And I think that's the question for the evening, and it's stirring in my spirit even now. And I, and I hope it stirs in yours, amen? We're going to start in Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read all familiar passages, so please don't tune me out. If you've been in church very long, you've probably heard some of these. But I hope to bring something new from these passages. We'll read this first passage, we'll pray, and then we'll get in. Amen? You ready? Here we go. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. Amen? But you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. And you got to read verse 18. For I consider 
that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen. We're going to talk about the process of inheritance tonight. Let's bow our heads and pray, please. Father, we thank you again for your presence. God, we thank you for your word and for what you are endeavoring to communicate tonight. And God, I ask that you would use me as a mouthpiece to do that. I believe that there is something in this for every person here. And Lord, they may be in a variety of places in their journey, but God, you know what they need. And you alone can make a living word that can reach to all those places. I ask you to do that, Lord. Father, together we open up our ears to hear. We open up our hearts to receive the good seed of the word, that it may come into the good ground of our hearts and produce fruit that remains. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Romans 8, written by Paul to the Roman church, and he says, he says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. If you ever want to be sure about where you stand, look at who's leading you. Look at what's leading you. If culture and society, life, the world, everything outside the, the, the Word and the house of God, family even, Whatever it is, if those things are leading you, then you got to check your status. Amen? Is that a fair warning? Because as many as are led by the Spirit of God, not by the family, not by their feelings, not by work, not by culture, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. These are the children of God. So if you ever want to know where you stand, look at who's leading you. Who are you following? Whose direction stirs you? Whose direction motivates you to change? Whose direction pushes you through? That's the question. That's out of verse 14. Verse 15 says that we did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. When he looked beyond our faults, he didn't answer with, with bondage. Amen? Amen. But he answered with a spirit of adoption. We receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. If culture or society lead you before God's spirit does, that should be an indicator. But we can rest assured, we can rest assured that if we have received the spirit of adoption, then the spirit himself within us bears witness with us that we are the children of God. I want to make a distinction here. There, there is a difference in being a child of someone and not being a child of someone. Is that a fair statement? Here's what I mean. When, when I was younger, especially, I remember, he probably doesn't remember this, but one time I asked my dad, because I have a, a younger sister, a biological sister, and I have an adopted sister, but when I was young, little guy, I remember asking my dad, which one of us is your favorite? Anybody ever ask that? Anybody with siblings ever ask that? Which one of us is your favorite? I mean, you probably kind of know, but no. But which one of us is your favorite? And I remember him saying, I love you both the same. And that just didn't equate in my mind. Because there's only one of you and there were two of us. So how can one person love two people the same? There's not enough of him to go around, right? And that, that was the understanding that I had. Now, when I had children of my own, I get it. The first kid, Keely, by the way, is 10 today. Yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy. She's not here tonight. Heather, Heather wasn't feeling well this evening, so they, they didn't make it. Uh, but uh, she's 10 today. And, and you know, I loved, I, I love her, and I loved her immediately, you know. And there was no doubt about it that she had all my love. But then the second one showed up six years later, and Natalie, and she's just a whole different person, you know. And, and she's awesome. And the first thing she'll say about herself is that she, she'll say, I'm smart, you know. I asked her the other day, well, why'd you do that? She said, because I'm smart. Well, that settles that. <laughs> well, and, and we do too. We, we tell her as well how smart she is. And she is smart. But I never understood what it meant to be able for one person to give all your love to two people and give it equally. But now I get it. I get it because they're my kids. They're my kids. They share the same status. There is something about their status that nobody else on the earth has. And, like, I'm a youth pastor. I love your kids, but if it's your kids or my kids, I'm picking my kids. You know what I mean? And likewise, I would expect that you would do the same. 
There's a status that they share. There's something peculiar about them to me, unique. Not peculiar as in weird, but peculiar as in unique. There's something unique about them to me. They're my kids. They look like me. They do things that I do. They have my personality traits. They're mine. They share a unique status. But we have received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Amen. And, and it's, it's old news here, but in, in Jewish culture, for someone to say Abba, Abba was a term that was used exclusively for people who were 100% Jewish. And their parents were 100% Jewish. That's what they called their father, Abba. And so God has given us a status through the work of Christ. Amen. Make no mistake. Jesus is the only way. Amen. He's the only door to the sheepfold. If you're going to try to get in any other way, you're a thief and a robber. That's what Jesus said. Okay, there is no other way. Not all roads lead to God. One road leads to God, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. But when we go through that road, when we enter through that door, we gain a status with the Heavenly Father, and that status is an equal status with Christ. That's what verse 16 says. I'm sorry, verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. See, we don't have to question our status with the Father because he, he has sent the spirit of adoption and we've received it. Amen. Have you received the spirit of adoption? Amen. I have received it. Therefore, he is my Father. I can call him Abba. I am 100% his. You are 100% his. His, you occupy a status that separates you from the people around you who don't know him. It separates you. Just like my kids are not your kids. They have a separate status. Oh, sure, we coexist. But they have a unique status. So we as believers share a unique status that is equal to Christ. And here's what I mean. We're equal in status not in inheritance. I want to make this statement, and that's going, to, that's going to cause you to stand up a little bit. Because in our culture, inheritance is equal. Right? We want everybody to be equal, warm and fuzzy, and everything's equal. All right? We want everything to be the same. Everybody's the same. Everybody's special, which means nobody is. But everything's the same. And yet in in when it comes to the kingdom of God, or even in our own families, we, we have kids that have the same status, but that doesn't necessarily mean you like them all the time. Let's, uh, this, is, this is humans. I'm not talking about God, okay? Humans. There are times you love your kids, but you don't like them. There's times you love your aunt or your uncle, or you know what I'm saying? There's times you love your family, but you like one a little more than you like the other. See, there, there can be an equal status and yet at the same time be a difference in inheritance. And I'm, I'm going to get there. I'm, I'm trying to get there. I'm sorry. So, there are no second class sons or daughters with God. Amen. We share that status. We're all on that level. Jesus paid a great price. Amen. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price. And when we accept that spirit of adoption, we are 100% his. We share that status with Christ. When he looks at Jesus and he looks at you, he sees his kid. You're not a step kid. You're not a half. You're, not, you're none of that. You're not an amalgamated family. None of that. You are 100% his because of the work of Christ that you have put your faith in. And yet, yet, even though through Christ our status is settled and God looks at us the same, that doesn't mean that God does not have something that is uniquely yours. Uniquely yours. Let's look at Christ, for example. Jesus, even though he is an equal son of God, you know, we, we're equal with him and, and all that, we don't obtain the same inheritance Christ has. Right? Let's go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. And I, I mentioned this this morning uh, in, in the service. Uh, in verse 8, it says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, or because he did that, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. 
Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Verse 11, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of, of, the, of God the Father. So the question is, when you get saved, do you get that? Do you get a name that's exalted above every name? No. Why? You, had a, you have a different mission. Jesus fulfilled his mission, didn't he? His mission was to go to the cross. He humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. See, our culture is so equality-based that we even compare ourselves against other believers. We've been trained to do that and say, wait, we're not equal, so it's not fair. Let's understand, what Jesus did wasn't fair. Amen? Aren't you glad you didn't have to do what he did? You want to go to the cross? You want to be ripped open with the cat of nine tails on your back? You want people to put you in a circle and beat you? You want them to spit on you and pull your facial hair out? <laughs> no, we don't want to be nailed to a cross. So because of his mission that he fulfilled, he gets a unique inheritance. I believe it's a pattern for us to look at. There is something that is up there, an inheritance for each of us. There is something that's got your name on it that's got nobody else's name on it. Amen? There is something for you based on what God has for you to do. Jesus obtained this because of his obedience. Therefore, we can reason that what God has for us can be obtained by obedience. Amen? You with me? What God has for you can be obtained by obedience. It's not up here in the clouds somewhere, untouchable, unattainable. No. Obedience will get you there. Obedience will cause it to become tangible or physical in your life. Obedience brings it down here. Jesus gets us the access. You with me? Jesus gets us the access. Once we have the access, our obedience brings the manifestation. Our obedience is what causes it to get in our hands, to become part of our everyday life, to become something that other people can see, the inheritance. See, if we were to see Christ right now, we would see him highly exalted and lifted up. That's where he is. He's at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and I, amen? That's the, the space that he occupies, and there is nothing that can change the space that he occupies, because of the inheritance that he has obtained through his obedience. So it's okay. It's okay to say, you know what? I didn't do what Jesus did, so I'm not going to get what Jesus got. But that doesn't change your status. You're still a son and daughter, amen? I don't have to go to the cross for anybody. I don't have to live a perfect life. I don't have to because he did. And because he did, I get the benefit, amen? I get the access. So, how often do we beat ourselves up as believers? And maybe this is just a minister thing. I don't think it is. That's why I'm going to say this. How often do we beat ourselves up as believers feeling second class because perhaps we're not walking in all that we feel like God has for us? Or because maybe we're not walking in what we see our neighbor walking in? This is a kind of a pastoral message. So, that's a real thing. I, I do that. You know how many times I've, I've had buddies. I had a friend one time who was a youth pastor. And he's like, man, I got 100 kids in my youth group. It's pumping right now. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong? Like, I know how this guy preaches. He's not real good. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not saying I'm better. I'm just saying I, I, I just didn't picture that. You know what I mean? That's not something that. I would picture sending my kids to, and, you know, that's comparison. Comparison kills, you know. Comparison's brutal, man. I heard one guy say in a podcast, you know, comparison causes us to produce short-term fruit. Isn't that good? I didn't say it. I don't know who said it. It was good, though. But it does because it makes us reactionary. Instead of being led by God, we try to lead God based on what we feel like we need to do. So comparison's brutal. And, I, you know, I just want to combat the idea that maybe we're falling short 
because we're not like somebody else. Let's throw that out the window. Let's throw that out the window. Jesus had a unique mission, and because of that, he has obtained through his obedience a unique inheritance. So that means I have a unique mission. You have a unique mission. There's a purpose that's made for you, and it's going to be your unique obedience that causes the inheritance to manifest in your life. And that's okay. That's great. Because you being what God's made you to be and me being what God's made me to be and all of us being what God has made us to be together makes an impressive, mighty force for the kingdom of God. Amen? That's what it's about. It doesn't matter if your kids are like their kids. It doesn't matter if your marriage looks like their marriage. Perhaps there's a unique mission there and a unique obedience, an opportunity that is exclusively yours to seize upon. That's what Christ did, and that is what is ahead of us. So I want to show you a couple of things. I want, to, I want to back up this idea of unique inheritance. I want to go to the parable of the talents. Have you heard, the, heard this story, the parable of the talents? Like I said, it's, it's familiar if you've been in church very long. It's in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 15. And this is Jesus talking. Jesus told parables. A parable is an earthly story that communicates a heavenly principle or a spiritual principle. It's a metaphor. And the meaning, the examples are physical, but the meaning is spiritual. So in this metaphor, Jesus tells a story. He says, he says unto one, he's talking about there, there was a, a king in a country, a lord in a country, and he was going to leave for a while. And he calls three of his servants to him. And it says in verse 15, unto one he gave five talents. A talent was a piece of money, a a value of money. And to another he gave two. And to another one, uh, and to another he gave one talent. To every man according to his several ability. And straightway took his journey. Then he that received the five talents, and uh, he, he went and he traded with the same five talents, and he made five more. And likewise, he that had received two gained also another two. Verse 18, but he that had received the the one went, and he dug in the earth, and he hid it. He hid his Lord's money. So I want you to see something, some, some things here. Again, these three men occupy a status that is unique. Why did why did this Lord in this story only choose three? You ever thought about that? And why was it these three? I'll show you why. Verse 16, I'm sorry, verse 15. Unto one he gave five, another two, and another one. To every man according to his several ability. What does this show us? This shows us that their unique ability is what influenced their inheritance. You with me so far? So they had a Lord who knew them so well that he knew what they were good at. He knew that the guy who he gave five to could handle the five that he was given. He knew the guy who got two could handle the two. And he knew the guy who had only been given one could handle that one. He believed in all three of these guys to the extent that he imparted some of his substance to them. And he entrusted them with his substance. See, Pastor asked earlier, how much do we want? How much do we want? What what have we walked in with that God is waiting to give us something to replace? I I think a, a lot of what people have a hard time giving up to God, they have a hard time giving it up because they don't expect anything in return. And see, God doesn't pull things out of your life and leave you empty. God doesn't pull junk out and leave holes open in you. He doesn't leave you like a piece of Swiss cheese with holes in it. No, the, 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 the interaction is meant to be an exchange. He pulls out that attitude and he replaces it with some fruit. Fruit of the Spirit, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance. Man, he pulls out that sickness and he replaces it with healing. He pulls out that curse language and he replaces it with edification, edifying words, building up. Good, you see what I'm saying? That's how it's supposed to work. That's the exchange. 
And so many times we don't want to give anything to God because truly, I, I believe, we don't know that he will take it or especially that he'll give us anything in return. Is that reasonable? That's how I've been in the past. There's times where I've done stuff and I've said, you know what, God don't want this. Why would God want this? <laughs> I did it. I want to own it. But God is the one who made the way out. Amen. God is the one who paid the great price. And I am his. I occupy that status. And he has something for me. And if I will give that up to him, he will give something down to me to replace it. That is what we're talking about tonight. And our obedience is what's going to manifest that. I know manifest is an old word. That's what's going to make it real in our life. Physical. So he gives to these men according to their several ability. Now I want you to understand, the work of Christ is what gets you the access. The work of Christ is what gives you the status. Because of Jesus, you can stand before God and cry out, Abba, Father. Amen? But then God looks at you and he says, I know. I know what Ed can do. And I'm going to give this to Ed. I know what Dwight can do. I know what's in him. I'm going to give this to him. I know what Connie can do, and I'm going to give this to her. Amen? And so now we have an opportunity for obedience. The obedience is what makes it real to us. It's what pulls it out of the kingdom of God and, and puts it in our hands. So he gives to these men as he will. See, in our culture, again, inheritance is not considered fair until it's equal. Have you ever known a family where someone has passed and the kids or whoever's left squabbles over the inheritance? Ooh. That's interesting, isn't it? Maybe you've been in that family. It's interesting what happens and the reasons people give and all that stuff because in our mindset, in our natural minds, we say, hey, it's not fair unless it's equal. But God says, hey, I don't want to put something on you you can't handle. Let's take my kids for an example. I was going to do a physical illustration with this, but it probably would have made me a bad dad, so I didn't do it. <laughs> and they're not here, so that, that too. But I was going to have Keely and, and Natalie come up. If I, Keely's 10, and she's about this tall, which I think is tall for a 10-year-old. I wasn't that tall at 14, so whatever. You all know it. You knew, most of you knew me at 14. So she's, she's pretty tall. Natalie's, Natalie's about here. And Keely's strong. She jumps on him quite a bit, too. She'll knock you down. She doesn't understand. You know, she's at that stage in life where she doesn't understand how big she is. You, you remember when your kids were there and they run up and they knock you over, you know, because they just don't get it. In their minds, they're still kids, but they're big. And so anyway, let's say Keely and Natalie are up here, and, and I, you know, they share the same status with me as, you know, each other. They're my kids. They're uniquely mine. Let's say I gave them a 15-pound weight. Let's say I gave Keely a 15-pound weight, and that weight was a, a symbol of her inheritance. You with me? I give that to her. Now, she's, she's big, but she's scrawny. She's skinny. She's got little bitty arms, little bird arms, you know, like she's skinny. And, and she could hold it for a while. She could carry it for a while. She could do some stuff with it. But after a while, even for a 10-year-old, she's going to have trouble holding on to that 15-pound weight, isn't she? Because she's not worked herself. She's not trained. She's not physically able to do with that. It's going to be a burden to her. Eventually. It may not be at first, but eventually it will. Now, let's say I take the same inheritance, and I give it to my almost 4-year-old. Am I a good dad? No. Is she going to end up with a hurt toe? At least one. Also why I didn't do the metaphor, literally, the illustration, literally. But, you know, she might be able to hold it. She might strain, uh, you know. Now, in human terms, that would be an equal inheritance, wouldn't it? But is it equally beneficial based on what they're capable of? No. No. See, God knows what you can do and what you can't do. Just like the Lord in the parable, he knew his guy could handle five. He knew the other guy could handle two, and the other guy could handle one. He knew it. And, of course, we know the outcome of the story. 
The outcome of the story, the servant with five, he invested five and gained more. He gained five more. The, the one with two did the same. The other guy buried it in the ground. And what happened? The Lord came back, and he rewarded the, one who had, the ones who had gained. They took what they had been given, and they made more. But he was angry with the one who buried it in the ground. Why? Did the Lord misjudge the man? Did the Lord not know something about him? Or did the man not know something about himself? Amen? He, he showed his own lack because he refused to obey. He was irresponsible with what he had been given as an inheritance. Now listen, I don't know what your inheritance is. For some people, your inheritance might be this. You know what I mean? It might be a stage and a microphone. For some people, your inheritance might be a healthy marriage. For some people, your inheritance might be a godly family. Or it might be beating that trend of alcoholism that's flowed down through your family. Or addiction. You with me? It could be, I don't know what your inheritance is. Maybe it's holding down a good job and and saving up and retiring and leaving your kids something. Maybe that is what God has for you. And that is fantastic. And that is uniquely yours. But it's up to you to say, God, I want it. God, I want to do with it what you have destined for me to do. And and see, the, the Lord knew that it would come natural for these guys to do something with what they had been given. They didn't sit on it. The one who did sit on it paid the price. It was taken from him and given to another. And and he was he lost some favor, but he didn't lose his status. Right? He, he was cast into outer darkness, but he wasn't expelled from the kingdom. He wasn't kicked out of the family because he didn't live up to the expectation. Amen. He, he suffered loss, but he was still in that circle of people. He was. So how often do our kids disappoint us? And, you know, like, like we said, we like one more than the other because of how they disappointed us. Or something, but they still occupy that same space of love. We love them. We'll give our life for them. But they need to step it up over here. So in this story, I believe that God shows us there's a unique inheritance that is for us. The Lord did not misunderstand his people. God does not misunderstand you. He knows exactly what you're capable of. He knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly your potential. He knows your limits. He knows that we are but dust. He knows our frame. There's all kinds of scripture that says God knows us. He knows the hairs on our head and the hairs that fell out. He knows us. And if he knows us, then we can rest assured that what he has for us is uniquely suited to our ability as he gave to every man's ability, right, Several to their several ability. So we can trust that God knows us and therefore God has something for you and for me that we can accomplish, something that we can do that he can look at us and say, well done. The goal is for him to say, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. It's not about a number. It's about faithful labor, right? That's what it's about. It's about achieving and obeying and through our obedience gaining inheritance. I'm going to do another story, familiar story. Luke chapter 15. We call it the the parable of the prodigal son. See, with the other servants, while you're turning there, with the other servants, especially with the third servant, the Lord saw something in him that he did not see in himself. And because of that, God had to call him on it. And he had to strip away some inheritance for a season. But, you know, we don't know. It was a, it was a metaphor. And I don't believe that for a second that because God may pull some inheritance back that he doesn't restore 
We know God restores. Amen. God is a good father. He's better at it than we are. And he knows what to do. And I want to show you the kind of father he is in this, in this parable of the prodigal son. Uh, we're going to start in verse 11. In Luke 15 it says, and, and Jesus said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not, not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey to a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Have you ever read this story and thought, man, that guy's not really a good dad? Everybody's quiet because they're like, wait, the father means God. <laughs> the father represents God. We can't say that. But the father knew his kids. And when the younger son came to him and said, hey, dad, I want my inheritance now, the father gave unto him that part that belonged to him, that was meant for him. Why? Was it because he was a bad father? Was it because he was a bad son? It was because of the potential that his father saw in his son. His father gave him exactly enough to succeed with. God gives you exactly enough to succeed with. You see, the simple requirement with inheritance is this, that you do it well. That is the requirement. And if not, you lose it. So we know how the story plays out. He goes and he wastes his, his living on riotous living. And in, in a far country, he tries to get out of his father's reach. He goes into a far country and he wastes himself and his stuff. And sometime later, he's working, you know, at a pig farm. And he decides that, you know, hey, there's bread enough in my father's house. You know, even the servants have enough at my, my dad's house. So I'm going to my dad's house. And so he, you know, he plans, you know, Father, you know, I'm not worthy to be called your son. He plans his big speech. And, you know, just let me be a servant. I'll live and work here, and please just let me do that. And, you know, as he approaches home, the father sees him because the father was looking for him. And he sees him while he was a great way off, and he runs toward him, and he embraces him. And he says, this my son that was dead is, is alive again. Amen. And he restores him into the family. He puts new shoes on him, new clothes on him, and a ring on his finger. And he throws a party for him. But let's not forget that the inheritance was wasted. Remember what the, what the faithful son did? The son that stayed? He was mad about the party. You ever been one of those Christians? I've been one of those Christians. I'll be real about it. You ever looked at somebody and you're like, but they were gone. But they did something stupid. I stuck it out. I stayed. I did the work. And that's what the guy did. He's like, Dad, what's going on? He wasted what you gave him. The, the prodigal son's waste did not change his status as a son. It did not change his status as a son. But it did bring waste and personal destruction. It still cost him. Because what did the father say to the faithful son? He said, son, all that's left is yours. All that's left is yours. Because he was obedient, he obtained the inheritance and he kept it. And we have no reason to believe, even though he was a little upset about his brother, we have no reason to believe that the prodigal or, or that the faithful son did not do well with what he was given. And man, in fact, we really can surmise the opposite that, or, 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 or that very fact that he did very well with what he was given because of how he had been doing well with what he had been given. So I want to challenge this sense of comparison. I want to say to you, no matter where you're at, no matter what you've come in with, I don't care how strong your addiction is or your attitude or your habits. I don't care how angry you are or how hurt you've been. If you come to Christ, you have access to something otherworldly. If you put your faith in Christ and the work that he's done, you gain a status that you can't gain any other way. There's no other way around it. You don't just become a shiny person when you accept Jesus. You don't just get clean. 
right? That comes with it. But you gain status. You gain rank in this existence. You're a son. But that also means as a son or a daughter that we act like our fathers and that we sound like our father. And you know, a lot of folks don't have a good father, so they don't know what that's like. They don't know how to be in the family of God. They don't know how. But we have a big brother, Jesus, who came and he said, hey, in my father's house there's many mansions. Why don't you come with me? Hey, man, my, my father's looking to adopt some sons and daughters. Why don't you come be a son or a daughter with me? Let's share the same status. See, he didn't do what we would do. We would gain status and hoard it and keep it. But instead, he freely gives and freely gives. And so he's done that for us, and now we have access, and we have the opportunity to obey. And as we obey, we begin to see and live in the inheritance that God has for us, whether it's a spiritual gift or spiritual fruit or whether it is healing or whether it is marriage or whatever it is, the inheritance, the potential that God sees in us. We gain access through Christ. It's the only way you can be different. It's the only way you can overcome what mama was. It's the only way that you can produce something new in your generations. It's the only way because he's the only way. Amen. But once you're in, you've got access to some new stuff. You have a new status. You've got a father that's got some stuff. He's not poor. He's not broke. And he's not distant. You've got access. And he wants to give you gifts. And he wants to give you fruit. See, he wants you to be nice as much as he wants you to speak in tongues. I mean, I know we're in a Pentecostal church, but. What good are spiritual gifts without spiritual fruit? Because your gifts without the fruit of the Spirit will bring destruction and confusion. Because you won't know how to use them. You won't have the integrity to use them. How are you supposed to prophesy to somebody if you can't love your neighbor? That wasn't harsh, right? I mean, that's that's a legit question. But so often people think, man, if I was gifted like Pastor Hall, Man, I'd be kicking butt in this life. I'd be killing it. Well, if you're not gifted in an area, maybe that's because there's some fruit that needs to grow first. Amen? Because God knows your potential. And if he knows your potential for good, he knows your potential for bad. He knows how far you can fall. Amen? And aren't we grateful for a God who knows that and yet he uses us anyway? Amen? Gosh, he gifts us anyway. And he he gives us fruit. You know, we're all about seeking the, the, the gifts of the Spirit, but let's seek the fruit of the Spirit. Let's try to be meek. Let's try to be gentle. Let's ask God to make us peaceable people. Let's ask God for self-control because our world needs people who have some self-control. And it can't be rooted in you because it won't last. It's got to be rooted in Him. So through Christ, we have access to something straight from God. His inheritance for us is unique and tailored to our ability. He is not going to put something on you you can't handle. If he's called you to marry that person, he can sustain you in that marriage. Amen? If he's called you to have those kids, if he's made the way for that to come, then he will enable you to be the kind of parent you need to be for those kids. Amen? If he has given you that opportunity at work, if it's from him, then he will enable you to do it well and to glorify him with it. Amen? If he has given you that gift to speak or that gift to pray or prophesy or speak in tongues, then he has given that to you because he knows you have the potential to handle it. You have the potential. But our obedience is what enables it to become part of us and and, and become something in our hands. And lastly, the only requirement is that we don't waste the inheritance that we use it well. Amen? We use it well. So often, I think we over-spiritualize the wrong things and under-spiritualize the right things. So often, we put the significance on the invisible and ignore the everyday practical. See, I can't move in a gift if my life's a wreck every day. I need God to change something in me. I need an exchange to happen. 
I need something to begin to change in me so that then I can start becoming who he wants me to be. You with me? Christ gives us access. And I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't even know. I don't know everybody in here today. But whatever you're dealing with, Jesus is your answer. We have tried him and found him to be the best answer. Amen? And I'm looking at these guys because we've tried him. And we know. And some of these folks around you have tried him. And we know that he is the answer. He has made the difference in us. Amen? He alone He alone has made us what we are. And he alone is a hope that we have of becoming anything else. Amen? That he is our hope. He is the access that you need. But he's got something for you. He's got something with your name on it. And that means someday you're going to stand before him and you're going to have to answer for it. But you know what? Even then you're going to stand before him as a son and daughter of God. You're not going to stand before him as an employee with a disgruntled boss. You've been in those meetings where it gets awkward real quick? Or God forbid you're on that side of it? You're not an employee with a disappointed, angry boss. You're standing before your father as a son or daughter. And he says, you know what? You did good here. Maybe not so much here. Let's Let's burn that away. Let's burn that away. Let's move forward into eternity with the good stuff. Let's take the good things with us. See, we won't be judged for our sin. Sin's been washed in the blood as believers. We stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we get judged based on the way we lived our lives in our bodies, the Bible says. So the only requirement is that we use it well. So what is your inheritance? That's what I'm asking. Maybe it is a spiritual gift. But maybe it's a spiritual gift partnered with a spiritual fruit, partnered with the right relationships, partnered with a good Bible habit every day, partnered with breaking off some bad relationships in our life. You see what I'm saying? It's far easier for us to say, God, I want your gifts. I want the manifestation of the glory of God. That's the Christianese thing to say, you know? But maybe your gift won't manifest till he fixes your attitude. So God fix my attitude. Amen. God fix my attitude. God fix my problem. Fix me so that I can be what you want me to be. Because I believe you've got something with my name on it. Amen. And that something is going to make a difference in somebody's life. It might be a hundred people or a thousand people or it might be the three people I live with. But it's going to make a difference in the life of somebody. So God, change me. Amen. God, change me. Amen. Make a difference. Make a difference in me. Stand with me this evening. Stand with me. Thank you for joining us on the Living Godcast. We hope you've enjoyed the message. For more information, we invite you to check us out online at www.wincitycolg.com or on Facebook. You can also download our app in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. Just search for Church of the Living God. We hope you have a blessed day.